You. May the Lord bless you. Before we get the cameras rolling, can I get a volunteer to read Revelation 1 through 11? 14, 1 through 11. Revelation 14, 1 through 11. Paul. God bless the volunteers in Israel. <laughs> There's fine, because the cameras aren't, they're not going to pick it up. 14, 1 through 11. Then I looked, and there was a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. I heard a sound from heaven like the sound of rushing waters and like the sound of pealing thunder. The sound I heard was also like that of harpists playing on their harps. They were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living beings and the elders, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who have been ransomed from the world. These are the ones who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They have been ransomed from among humanity as first fruits for God and the Lamb. On their lips no lie was found. They are without defect. Next I saw another angel flying in mid heaven with everlasting good news to proclaim to those living on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. In a, in a loud voice he said, Fear God, give him glory, for the hour has come when he will pass judgment. Worship the one who made heaven and earth the sea and the springs of water. Another angel, a second one, followed, saying, She has fallen, she has fallen, Bavel the Great. She made all the nations drink the wine of God's fury caused by her pouring. Another angel, a third one, followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in its image and receives the mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will indeed drink the wine of God's fury, poured, poured undiluted into the cup of his rage. He will be tormented by fire and sulfur before the holy angels and before the Lamb. And the smoke from their tormenting goes up forever and ever. They have no rest, day or night, those who worship the beast and its image, and those who receive the mark of its name. Amen. Okay. I'm ready if you guys are. I'm on a timer. Well, Shabbat Shalom to you. And Shabbat Shalom to those who are watching on IsraelNet TV or those who might be listening by tape. We did not have the traditional readings today. We have uh, what's called Second Day Shavuot readings. Um, Shavuot was yesterday. It concluded at sundown and we celebrated and uh, we had liturgy. We prayed together. We ate together. Uh, did a little singing together. We fellowshiped. And in the message yesterday, this was part one, I wanted to show you how the three pilgrimage, the reglaim, the reglaim means feet, it's the, the three festivals that are commanded where you literally had to walk on your feet to make it to J Jerusalem, the place where he would put his name. And so these three particular pilgrimage festivals are all tied together. And at Shavuot, which is where we are, the Feast of Pentecost that was just concluded, we can see in Shavuot that there is a connection, there is a tie between Passover, between Pesach, counting forward to Shavuot, they're not disconnected, and from Shavuot we will see today that there is a connection to Sukkot. These three festivals are all tied together, it's one journey. There's three stops on that journey, but there is one journey. And what did we learn last night? As we encamp, so shall the journey be. As we pause on our Sabbaths, as we pause on the sab high Sabbaths of the festivals, as we make those encampments, so shall the next leg of that journey be. 
And that was in last week's Torah portion. So for this week, uh, I'd like to follow up. And while last night I taught on working for Shavuot, working for Pentecost, how many of you still think that the Shabbat is a day of rest? It's not. <laughs> you missed the message. <laughs> Because we are commanded, it says in English, to celebrate the Sabbath, not just the weekly Sabbath, but the high Sabbath, the, the Shabbaton, the high Sabbath of the festivals, of Passover, of first fruits, of Shavuot, of Pentecost, and of Sukkot. There are two Sabbaths in that celebration. But as they translated that word from the Hebrew, they said, celebrate it. Well, when I think of celebrate, I think kind of like a party. But when you read it in Hebrew, the word is la'asot, to make, to do. We don't just sleep through the Sabbath. We don't just sit through the Sabbath. We make and we do and we continue to create because it says that God finished His work on the Sabbath day. He had to make rest. And in that, and in following after Yeshua and imitating His customs on the Shabbat, that is how we are going to find what rest really is. It's not sitting and sleeping. It's another type of work. It's a continuation of making and doing and creating. And so part two today, now that we've talked about working for Shavuot and how Ruth and Boaz worked diligently for the sake of the covenant and to bring the Gentiles into the covenant, to draw them in, not to reject them. Because remember, at Shavuot, at Pentecost, that's when the Torah was given at Sinai. It was offered to the entire world. It was offered to those standing there and those who were not standing there. And the rabbis say that that Torah was actually offered in every known tongue on earth. But Israel alone said, we will do and we will hear. And they accepted that covenant. And then it says that tongues of fire descended upon the camp of Israel, and it prophesied the Torah on each person. And you can see that reenacted in the second chapter of Acts. As they were gathered according to the commandment, the Father will always fulfill His promises according to His appointed times and appointed seasons. They are rehearsals. They prepare us. We are supposed to practice each Sabbath and each year annually for the festivals. So that as they are fulfilled, if we are blessed enough to see a particular festival fulfilled in our lifetimes, then we will know how to act because we've rehearsed all our lives for it. You know, that was the problem when Yeshua came. His people had rehearsed all their lives for His coming and they didn't recognize it because they didn't recognize Him as the fulfillment. We have to open our eyes and look beyond just the literal doing. So now we're to part two, working for Shavuot. Now we're going to have to fight for Sukkot. If you don't think there's a war going on and that the Midianites would not like to seize your Sabbaths and would like to seize your festivals and would like to possess you so that you cannot keep the commandments, you're deceived. There is warfare going on in the heavenlies. And the place that they will attack you is at these three festival seasons and at your weekly Shabbat. Because remember, as you camp, so shall your journey be. If you allow the Midianites to possess your Sabbaths and your festival seasons, then you have just determined the course of your next leg on the journey. As we encamp, so shall our journey be. So the readings that we had today for the second day of Shavuot were Devarim, Deuteronomy 16, 1 through 17, and Judges 6 through 8, 21. And just for your own information, if you're watching my TV, it would be helpful if you would read the entire chapter of Revelation 14 and John 5. Those are readings from the Brit Chadashah that will certainly shed light on the three festivals. Now I ask someone to read from Revelation 14 because remember what I said a few weeks ago. If you want to understand the book of Revelation without the Torah, again you're deceived because Revelation is a miniature Torah. 
If you don't know the signs, if you don't know the symbols, you're missing the big picture. John was writing to people who knew the Torah. So you're not going to understand Revelation if you don't understand the prophets. You're not going to understand the prophets if you don't understand the Torah. Because Revelation 14 is all about the three festivals. Did you hear how it started out? What is the name of Yeshua that was used? The Lamb. What does Lamb bring to mind? Passover. That's your first festival in the progression. Now I want to continue. I want to continue reading in Revelation 14 starting with verse 12. Remember we talked last night about the patience of Ruth and Boaz in walking out that covenant plan that they made. It said, here is the perseverance, here is the patience of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Yeshua. Notice their one thing. Keeping the commandments and your faith in Yeshua are one thing. And I heard a voice. When you think of a voice at Shavuot, at Pentecost, what do you think of? Good. This is the voice, right? I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. All that hard work we talked about last night, the work that we have to do, not just in our daily journey, but the making and the doing, the preparing and the planning and the diligence that is required of us to properly make a Sabbath and to properly make a festival day. Notice what it says, that you may rest from that labor because your deeds will follow after you. The deeds that you do on the Sabbaths, the deeds that you do on the festivals, the commandments that you keep that are part of your Torah covenant, that's the new covenant, the Torah written on your heart, those deeds that you do out of love for your Messiah, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you do that, this says, when this terrible thing begins to happen in the earth, you rest. You rest from your labor. You have worked hard. You have been diligent. You have been devoted. And now he says, rest. Those deeds, what you have done in your encampment, has followed you on your journey. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. It's another picture now. You notice the picture has changed. At first we see him as the lamb. But now he is seen as the son of man, and his appearance is more like the grim reaper at this point. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, because the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. This is not a good harvest. This is not the harvest that we want to be in. We want to be with those who are resting from their labors when this begins to occur. We want to participate. You know, in everything we've talked about in the Torah, in God's Word, there's a good side, there's a bad side. Well, we can see here the bad side of the harvest. When we are faithful and diligent to celebrate Shavuot and the reaping of the first fruits of the barley, when we do that work, we are preparing so that we may one day rest in that cloud with Messiah Yeshua while the bad harvest is beginning. And now we're moving. You can see here we've gone from Passover to the symbols of Shavuot, which is the harvest, the first fruits of the barley harvest, the giving of the Torah. And now we're going to change to Sukkot, to the Feast of Tabernacles, because the, the picture, the symbol of Sukkot is the threshing floor and the wine press. We heard that in the Torah reading. 
It says, And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. And another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out from the altar, and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine from the earth, because her grapes are ripe. Now I know that we are in the vine. You don't want to be in this harvest because there is a vine of Sodom that the scripture talks about. It says, And the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood came out from the winepress up to the horses' bridles for a distance of 200 miles. You don't want to be in that Sukkot celebration. That's not where you want to be. You want to be with those who are resting from their labors because their deeds have followed them. We see that in Revelation 14. It begins with the Passover lamb. It moves forward to the feast of the first fruits of the barley into Shavuot, where the, actually the wheat harvest will begin there. And that's why it continues and it ties it forward into Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, because from Shavuot to Sukkot, you're, at that time you're reaping wheat instead of barley. Barley comes first, wheat comes second. Shavuot is the dividing line. So, the first fruits, it says, and when do we collect first fruits? Three times. Passover is the first fruits of the barley harvest. At Shavuot we have the first fruits of the wheat. And then at Sukkot we have first fruits of the everything else. Okay. Uh, wine press and threshing floor are the two symbols there. But that's where you see a lot of times they would bring in big baskets of vegetables and things that didn't ripen until later in the season at Sukkot. So we have a first fruits of 144,000 people. Does anybody remember one of the things that has no measure? First fruits. We are commanded to bring first fruits, but it's never really designated how much. You get to decide out of your own heart how much first fruits is. It's not like a tithe, which is a tenth. The first fruit is open. How big the corner of your field is, is up to you. How many constitutes of first fruits is up to you. That's in your heart. But in this case, in Revelation, we see that the first fruits are 140,000 men, 12,000 from each tribe. And they have been sanctified much the same way that the men were at Sinai when the Torah was given at Pentecost. Because remember, he says, wash yourself, wash your clothes, and set yourself apart from women for three days. Get ready. We're about to make a covenant. We're about to enter into a marriage covenant. So these 144,000 first fruits have observed a very similar thing. They've been washed and separated from women. They're prepared. And whatever the total number might be, we have no way of knowing. All we know is how much the first fruits is. There's a little mystery to figure out maybe. But this connects the Pesach lamb to Shavuot to Sukkot. Now how can we tell that this earthly meeting, or not earthly, this heavenly meeting that took place in the heavenly temple was signifying to us Shavuot? Well, it began, remember, with Passover. At Passover, that is the season where we're going to have to decide when the first fruits of the barley is ready, right? Because you have the day of Passover, then you have uh, Feast of First Fruits of the Barley, and then that week is unleavened bread. It's all really one big festival kind of crammed into one. But at some point in there, it says that you cannot eat grain until you have waved and offered that first fruits of the barley. So, how do we know that what's taking place in the temple in Revelation is occurring at that time? Well, remember, in this heavenly temple, there's a decision being made. We can't see inside of that temple. We're only told how it looks from the outside. And then all of a sudden this angelic messenger comes out of the temple 
And he gives a message to the Son of Man who's sitting on a cloud with a sickle, and he says it's time to reap. When was that decision made? In an earthly sense, that decision is made during Passover. Because we can't eat grain until the first fruits is offered. If we were to live in the land and there were to be a functioning temple, the priests have to decide when that barley is ready. And that is a, a council that must take place. They're going to examine barley from different parts of Israel and say, is it time? Is the barley ready? And remember Yeshua said, no man knows the day or the hour, but he did say we can know the times and the seasons. How confusing is that? Well, in that time when there was a temple, you really didn't know the day or the hour when the first fruits would be offered because you had to examine the barley and the priests had to decide whether it was ready. You knew the time and the season. You knew approximately the frame that this was going to take place in, but that exact hour that the priestly council would come out and say, it's time to reap. Time to reap? Yes, it's time to reap. With this sickle? Yes, with this sickle. That's what's going on in that heavenly council. There is a, a council in the heavenly temple. And at some point in the future, they are going to sit down and they are going to say, is it time for this barley harvest? And at that point, a messenger will go out and he will say to Yeshua, reap with this sickle, with that sickle. That harvest we don't want to be in. It says that Yeshua is sitting on a cloud. The Son of Man is sitting on a cloud. Do you remember what a cloud represents? So great a cloud of witnesses. These are the witnesses to the covenant. Remember it says that Adonai is enthroned upon the praises of his people, right? He sits on those praises. Yeshua returns with a great cloud of witnesses. So. In a sense, when we are witnesses of Him, remember the angel came out with that good news, when we give that good news, when we preserve our covenant, when we make our Sabbaths, when we make our festivals, when we are consistent, when we work hard and we fight for our covenant, then we are part of that great cloud of witnesses. And we are with Him at that harvest. I also would like to think that we are awaiting with him the decision about that barley harvest. That we are just as interested as he is in hearing that final word, go and reap with that sickle. Because if we anticipate, that means we are prepared. We are anticipating the festivals. We are anticipating our Sabbaths. We are anticipating keeping the commandments. And because we are alert, because we are ready, because we have worked, we are awaiting that word just as anxiously as he is. But those in the temple did decide that finally action needed to be done. And the only decision that coincides with that in the Torah is the decision concerning the barley harvest. It depends upon those priests to examine the harvestability of that crop. And then the final decision is made. And then we know that there's a rest day, there's a day of rest, and then that first wave is waved, there's loaves made and so forth, there's a a beating of the grain and the roasting of the grain. We've had lessons on that before. But then the reapers begin reaping that barley up until Shavuot. The barley continues to ripen and we begin to count the seven weeks up until Shavuot, counting the Omer. And then at that time we're going to start on the wheat harvest. But you notice that even Yeshua, who was the reaper of that great heavenly court, he awaited the word, he awaited the decision, and maybe that's why he said, no man knows the day or the hour, only my Father in heaven. Only he knows when that decision is going to be made to reap. But now we see that the commandment to reap the earth comes from a heavenly temple council. Last night we saw that the barley, the symbol of the barley, was associated with devotion, with hard work. It's the poor man's bread. But now we're going to see that barley is associated with 
war. The first fruits of the barley harvest coincides with the reaping of the earth. When you couple barley with war, it's going to explain a whole lot about what happened to Gideon, isn't it? Because remember what tumbled down into the enemy's camp? Barley bread. He said, oh, that barley bread, that's the sword of Gideon. So not only do we have to work for Shavuot, we are going to have to fight for Sukkot. That's the symbol of the barley. That is Gideon's sword. And if we look, we can understand that not only do we have to work to make our festivals and our Sabbaths an act of worship, sometimes we have to make war. We have to fight for our Sabbaths. And we have to fight for our festival seasons. Let's look at the symbols and the acts of the three festivals that are associated with Gideon's victory. It's played out as a miniature exodus. Did any of you catch that? You could read the story of Exodus in Gideon. And it even goes right down to that disconnection of time that sometimes occurs in Scripture. Do you remember right after the Israelites are delivered from Egypt, it says they camped first at a place called... Well, now how did they skip Shabuot? You don't go from Pesach to Sukkot. You go from Pesach to Shabuot and then to Sukkot. But something different happened there. Something was out of time. Do you remember when Jacob comes back to the land? He had promised Adonai, I will go here. And I will do this. I will sacrifice in this place. And I will give my first fruits to you. But instead, the first thing he does is he stops and he sets up housekeeping at a place called Sukkot. Now how did he go from there to there? He skipped something. Do you remember when the disciples saw Yeshua speaking with Moses and with Eliyahu? It's at the Passover season when they see this. What do they want to build? Sukkot. They're trying to skip something. And Yeshua had to remind them, no, you stay in Jerusalem until Shavuot. Don't skip it. It's not time for Sukkot yet. Follow the order. Even if you look at how the people were worshiping the Lamb as He came into Jerusalem for the Passover, they were not worshiping Him as though He were the Passover Lamb. They were worshiping Him as though it were Sukkot. They're waving the branches. They've got the species associated with celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. They're using the language of Sukkot even in their worship. What's happening there? Well, that's where Gideon begins his story, too. He starts at Sukkot. How do we know that? Because it says he was threshing wheat in a wine press. Why is he doing that? Well, he's afraid the Midianites will see him and, and attack him. But why would he be using a wine press and threshing wheat when, as we continue reading, we realize it's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Because that's what he makes when he brings back to that angel. He makes uh, unleavened bread to offer, and he brings back a kid, a young goat. Remember, you can offer a lamb or a young goat at Pesach. So it's clearly the Passover season, but he's threshing wheat out of time in a wine press, which is a clear symbol of Sukkot. And he's doing this. He's afraid the Midianites are going to see him. He should be up on a hill somewhere. He should be out in the open so that the wind, so that the Ruach, the Spirit, can catch that chaff and carry it away. But because Israel had been disobedient, they had fallen into idolatry. They had failed to preserve their covenant. They had failed to work for it and be diligent for it. Now they're doing their work in hiding. And this is what Gideon is teaching. What if we haven't done our work? What if we've not worked for our Sabbaths? What if we've not worked for our festivals? And finally, the enemy has so far encroached upon us that we can't even keep our festivals and our Sabbaths for fear of what the Midianites might do to us. We're hiding out. We become virtual slaves, just like their ancestors in Egypt. 
they were in bondage to the Midianites. And it's so bad, it says that the Midianites and their camels were compared to a plague of locusts, just like came on Egypt. So, at first, like Moshe hiding in the backside of the desert, we find Gideon hiding from his enemies. And like Moshe, when the angel of the Lord comes, he says, Oh, not me. I'm too small. I'm the youngest. I'm in the smallest clan and the smallest tribe. You can't use me. The same way Moshe said, Oh, not me. I'm, I, I, I can't even talk for myself. You don't want me. Same thing happens. They both believe that they are insignificant to act as deliverers for Israel. And remember, there was a burning bush that didn't burn up. The angel of the Lord touches that rock. It says fire came up out of it. It burned the offering, but the rock was fine. We have something else that burns to consume, and then the other part of it doesn't burn. Like Moshe, who needed his brother Aharon to give him some confidence, Gideon, remember, he took Pura. He says, all right, take your friend down there with you to spy out the camp. If you're just too weak to go alone, take somebody with you. So we did that. And we can see he's also like Moshe. He needs a miraculous sign to convince him that this is the Lord. Moshe, you know, he's got his staff and he's got the little leprosy thing going on. And that's going to serve as a sign not just to him but to the elders of Israel that this is actually a sign that the Lord is ready to lead us out. Gideon also asked for a sign. He said, I'm going to put this fleece out here. Let there be water in it and surrounding dry. Okay, now reverse it. He got his sign. Remember, at the encampment of Sinai, as they were coming out of Egypt, they were supposed to wash with water for sanctification. And Gideon puts his men to the test at the water side to determine those who would be sanctified for war. Remember, the shofar sounded on the mountain with thunder and with fire. What does Gideon give his warriors? The shofar representing the voice of God. He gives them also clay jars to break for a sound like thunder. And he gives them torches to symbolize the fire on that mountain. So we know that in that battle, clearly in Gideon's mind, he's thinking Shavuot, he's thinking Pentecost. When we receive this covenant that we have neglected, now, Israel, let's reenact, let's remember, let's take to heart the sound of the shofar, the fire on the mountain, and the sound of thunder, that sound of breaking. We see also that, like Moshe Gideon, was insulted by the elders of Israel. And we see also that, like the Israelites who looted the Egyptians on their way out, Gideon's army loots the Midianites of their jewelry and their gold. And we see that, like the Israelites who deli whose deliverance, their mikvah, their baptism, was coming through that water, that also Gideon commands Israel to take possession of all the wells and water sources. You get a hold of that water because there's living water. That's what we need. So we see Gideon in the context of Passover. And that represents to us our household salvation, our personal salvation. And it says that he presents an offering of the matzah, the unleavened bread, and the kid. But in response to that, and this is an important message of Passover, what the angel of the Lord asks him to do is to tear down the idolatrous symbols in his father's household. Remember, it's personal and household salvation. So at Passover, the proper thing for us to do if we find ourselves surrounded by Midianites who will not allow us to observe our Sabbaths and our festivals in freedom, we need to look around our own houses. We need to look around our father's houses. Remember, it said, we will say our fathers have given us lies. We inherited lies. Gideon had inherited some lies from his father in the form of a god called Baal. And he had an Asherah pole, an Ishtar pole, an Easter pole. That's where that comes from. We need to look around, and if we've got Asherah poles, if we have relics 
of things that belong to gods that are not gods, we need to go ahead and get rid of them. That's the first step, is your own home, your own household. What have you inherited from your family that is based on lies? Get rid of it. Now, he didn't just charge right in there. Notice, he kind of sneaked in under the cover of darkness. Sometimes when you first start out and you realize how your life has been overtaken with foolish things, it's not easy to charge right in there and just start tossing everything. Might need to be prudent. But he did. He had to throw off that yoke of his father's household idol idolatry in order to prepare himself for a battle. Because that's only the first step. That's only at Passover. If you want to lead clans and tribes into battle to take back your covenant freedom, you're going to have to start with your own household. So let's look at what he's doing. Threshing wheat in the wine press, a symbol of Sukkot, but not Pesach. Sukkot is this third pilgrimage festival when we bring the produce of the threshing floor the wheat, the wine from the wine press. These were to be brought in as acts of worship. So why is Sukkot so out of joint? So many times in Scripture. I don't know. But it's there. And if something is out of joint, something is out of time, it's that way for a reason. It's to teach us something. I think in the case of Israel, if we look at each time it appears out of time chronologically, we can see that there is a problem that they are skipping something important, that they're getting ahead of themselves. But yet, and when we get over to Revelation, the chronology is perfect. In Revelation 14, it's absolutely perfect. Nothing skipped, nothing's out of joint. The Passover lamb, the barley harvest of Sukkot, culminated in Shavuot, and the final threshing and pressing of Sukkot. The next inkling we have that Gideon's preparations and battles occurred during this festival timeline is that when he goes to spy out the Midianite camp, remember he heard the dream of the loaf of barley bread tumbling into the camp and overturning a tent. In scripture, what does a tent represent? Your, your physical body. Remember Paul said, the tabernacle of this body, the tent of this body. So if this tent gets overturned, what has happened to the physical body? You're dead. It's over. And so he hears this dream that encourages him. He says, oh, wow. You know, if, if the enemy's having a dream that I'm killing them, then the Lord must be with me. You know, all the, the fire out of the rock and the fleece and all these things, if that weren't enough, now I hear that the very enemy is acknowledging that the Lord is with me in this war. So the barley represents Shavuot, Israel's national salvation. We've gone from household and personal salvation and we've moved forward to Pentecost, to Shavuot, and we're talking now about national salvation. This is when Israel formally became a people. They formally became a covenant people. They formally became betrothed at Sinai. And this is also marked by the ingathering of the righteous Gentiles from the nations. We can see that clearly in Acts chapter 2. So at Shavuot, to come one day, it will be clear whether you have already been joined at Shavuot as part of a national salvation, as part of a formal taking on that covenant, that marriage covenant, or whether you are part of those righteous from the nations that join like Ruth at Shavuot, or whether you're not, because Shavuot is when the judgment will take place. That is when it will be decided. And you will either be part of that in gathering, or you will be part of a harvest you don't want to be in. The oppressive nations that gather. Where did they gather? Which valley? Jezreel. You'll read about that in Revelation too, by the way. When these oppressive nations gather and they are not part of the righteous from the nations, there will be a judgment at Shavuot. 
The barley harvest in Revelation is followed by that declaration that the work of the righteous, those who have been patient, who have worked hard and kept the testimony of Yeshua, you can rest. That's the time for rest for the good work that you have sown in Messiah, in a heavenly harvest. And we established that last night, that barley and Shavuot do signify that hard work, that devotion, that diligence for the covenant. And we learned as we encamp, so shall our journey to Sukkot be. What we did yesterday at Shavuot has set things in motion in spiritual realms. And as we celebrated that Sabbath day, that high Sabbath, we have determined the nature of our journey from then until Sukkot. And if you don't think there's going to be a battle between now and Sukkot, you're deceived. We lost the last one. I don't want to lose another one. I don't want to lose because it is a fight for the covenant. For all those things we talked about last night. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors so their deeds may follow them. As we have sown our devotion here on earth, so shall our blessings follow us on that heavenly journey. At the time of this very frightening harvest on earth, the Scripture says that we who have worked diligently in that covenant can rest. Remember, there is another rest for those who wait for Him. I want to wait for Him. It may be your diligence now that exempts you from a horrible harvest that is to come. A harvest of wrath, the day and the hour determined by that heavenly court upon the command of the Father. And I think it's at this time that the true harvest is going to be separated from the tares because it will be made evident who labored in the covenant and who only appeared to labor in the covenant. Because Shavuot is the predetermined time that the nations of the earth are gathered either to the covenant or forever separated from it. And you can see that in the second book of Acts. There were people from every nation on earth. And when that spirit fell, when the fire fell the same way it did at the first Shavuot, there were some who heard and believed. And they were immersed. They were sanctified. They were put through a mikvah. They were set apart. They became part of that covenant. But how many more heard and did not? They're in a different harvest. We want to be in that harvest like occurred in the second chapter of Acts. We want to hear, believe, be immersed, be sanctified. We don't want to be judged for rebellion against the covenant and the covenant people. Because those nations will be gathered together one day for a harvest of the wicked which will last all the way to Sukkot. Can you imagine the carnage that would take place when those bundles of tares and those final clusters of grapes are thrown into the fires and thrown into the wine press of Adonai Tzebaot's wrath? We know Him as mercy. We know Him as grace. We know him as tenderness and kindness and care. Our kinsman redeemer like Boaz who would never hurt us, who would never let us come to harm, who will not rest until he brings us completely into the covenant. But we've never known him like this. And let us pray that we don't. They cannot endure the judgments of Adonai's voice. Those judgments will come with the sound of a shofar. If you don't know what a shofar sounds like, we've got the best shofar blower I've ever heard right here in our congregation. He when he blew that shofar last night, I almost couldn't stand up. The spirit was all over this place at the sound of that shofar. Imagine that shofar coming out of heaven. How it will sound. No one can stand under that judgment if they are not in Messiah. That is how you stand in the fire and you are not burned. That is how you walk through the water and you are not drowned. It is to be completely in Him when you hear the judgments unloosed with the sound of these shofars. Gideon's army, that loaf of barley bread, rolls into the Midianite camp 
and they're carrying these very symbols. They're carrying shofars. And then at one point, they all break these jars of clay. What does that represent? That also represents a body, the body of the wicked. Because remember, it's the clay that's smashed, but we are refined into fine metal, into silver and gold. We don't want to be jars of clay at the judgment. We want to have allowed these bodies of flesh to have been refined into fine metal because the, the clay jug's going to be smashed. So the body of the wicked will one day be smashed. They also carried the lightning and the fire. Remember, it gave them torches to carry in those jugs. We also, at this point, we are vessels and jars of clay, but inside of us we have a torch. We have this lamp shining inside of us. We have to remember that. One day this body will be smashed. And it remains to see what will be of these bodies. We have to keep that in mind. We have to carry the voice, the fire of the Word of God. We have to be willing. It says he gave a shofar to every single man in the army. 300 shofars blowing at one time. Can you imagine blowing over the valley of Jezreel if you've ever seen it? Standing up on those mountains. The voice of 300 shofars. Man, what will the coming of Messiah be? Can we stand? Be this shofar is His Word. It is His Word that will judge us. Sukkot, remember, is that thousand-year festival of ingathering to Messiah. There might be uh, famine. We think it's always just resting in the Lord. Well, for some of us, it will be. Resting and working. Remember, rest is work on the Sabbath. Different type of work, but it's work. There will be a rest for those who are in Messiah. But it says during that millennial kingdom, the, the families of the earth will go up to Jerusalem and they will bring their tribute and they will celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Sukkot. Everybody will be doing those festivals at that time whether they want to or not. What's the penalty if you don't go? What's the penalty if you don't celebrate the Feast of Sukkot with the Messiah? No rain. No rain. Nothing. Famine. It's our obedience that we need to remember during these festival seasons. Because if we don't bring our first fruits to the King of Kings, we have every right to expect a famine. A famine of the Word of God in our lives. A famine of the Spirit of God in our lives. Because that is reserved. The Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot, the rest and the joy and the celebration and the happiness and the dancing is reserved for those whose deeds have followed them. It's what you do now that determines what that will be for you. It's an era of peace for those who have harvested and fought for the kingdom of heaven and been faithful to that covenant. Notice Gideon, he selected 300 men, starts with 32,000, ends up with less than 1%. 300 men who were actually committed to the covenant, committed to the fight, committed to the covenant people, regardless of the personal cost, they each had to leave something. A warrior leaves something behind. But that barley symbolized the victory that's possible when we dedicate ourselves to the covenant beyond convenience. Remember, it's anything but convenient. It's also a shame to Israel that there's so few able-bodied warriors in the harvest. It says in Joel 111, Be ashamed, O farmers. Wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is destroyed. It is not God's will that that harvest be destroyed the way that it will be. And it's to our shame that the farmers and the vine dressers that we have not been diligent to go out into the harvest and to work for that covenant. Why 300 men? Why three companies? 
Well, the number three is a divinely appointed number. It teaches us a lesson about the completeness of our salvation because at Passover, we celebrate our personal salvation. He is our Passover lamb. At Shavuot, we gain a new level of maturity because we are betrothed to our husband there. We are given the Torah, which is our marriage covenant. We are brought into a more mature level of understanding. We enjoy a national salvation. We are joined to Israel as one. And then at Sukkot, we are to function as mature adults because he says, don't you know you will judge angels? You don't give that job to a child. You don't understand the festivals? Are you going to judge angels? They understand them. Oh, much better than we do. How will you judge what you do not know? Three is a divinely appointed number. There are three pilgrimage festivals. It's the history of our personal salvation. And it draws our attention to the journey through these three festivals. The number three in Hebrew it represents the past, the present, and the future. There's three tenses in Hebrew. There is completed action. There is action that is occurring right now. And there is action that has yet to be completed. Just three. It's not nearly as complicated as English. <laughs> past, past imperfect, present perfect, and all that. And I think it's all imperfect if you ask me. <laughs> Three's enough for anybody. Past, present, and future. It's a threefold capacity that we have. We have the capacity of thought. We have the capacity of word. And we have the capacity of deed. Three is pretty much the first of four different perfect numbers. Twelve is governmental perfection. We have 12 tribes for one nation. There are 24 elders around the throne representing the perfect council of Elohim in both the heaven and the earth. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 24 elders. 12 disciples represented the government of Yeshua sent to the nations. 10 is ordinal perfection. We have 10 men that represent an entire congregation. It's called a minion. Why? Because 10 evil spies were called an evil congregation. But if we have 10 righteous men, we have a righteous congregation. And that's also why Gideon selected 10 men to go with him in the dark to go tear down those idols. He said, come with me. I need a congregation. I just don't want to do it in the daylight. <laughs> There's also ten words that represent the entire divine Torah, the entire divine instruction. Seven is a number of spiritual perfection. The seventh day is the crown of our spiritual growth. Seven weeks are counted the Shavuot. The seventh year is a year of freedom and so forth. But three is what we're looking at because three is the dominant number in the story of Gideon. And three is the number of the pilgrimage festivals and we have just passed the crossroad. We are one baby step between Shavuot and Sukkot. Divine perfection is the number three. The angels around the throne say, Good. Abraham had how many visitors? Yet he addressed them as, He prepared how many measures of meal for these visitors? Three. The ironic benediction mentions mentions the sacred name how many times? Three. Three. Three pilgrimage festivals that draw us to the place where he says he will put his name. Three is also the number of the resurrection from the dead. Sometimes festival season reminds us we need to be resurrected from the dead. Amen. The earth from which Adam was formed came out of the water on which day? The third day. It was resurrected out of the water. There are three patriarchs. There are three priestly lines. There are three divisions of the Tanakh. Three times Israel answers at Shavuot, all the Lord has spoken, we will do. Three aspects of divine judgment, which is numbering, weighing, and dividing. Three ways to corrupt the Torah. We can add to it, we could subtract from it, or we can alter it in some way. Three times Yeshua said it is written. Yeshua raised three persons from the dead. 
There are three aspects of Yeshua as a shepherd. He is the good shepherd in death. He is the great shepherd in resurrection. And he is the chief shepherd in glory. Yes. Hey. Hebrews says that Yeshua has appeared to put away sin. It says he now appears in the presence of God for us. And he shall appear apart from the question of sin to those who look for him. The Abrahamic covenant was made with three animals at three years old. It was necessary for Israel to go three days journey into the wilderness to be safe from that spiritual influence of Egypt. Yeshua says, wherever two or three are gathered in my name. Yeshua also reminds us that there were three Hebrew children that were not burned up in that fire. Why? They were in Him. They were looking for Him even before His physical appearance. They remembered. They kept their covenant. They did not forget. They did not become lazy. They were diligent. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. The three closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, who witnessed to the disciples after the resurrection, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary the mother of James. Who was there at the crucifixion? Mary the mother of Yeshua, Mary the mother of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Three witnesses. So three is an important number. But it also reminds us that the number of true worshipers are few. If we go from 32,000 men out of all the thousands of Israel who could fight, 32,000 show up. Out of 32,000, 300 are actually fit for the fight. That's less than 1%. But this small number was going to ensure that the glory only went to the Holy One of Israel. Yes. They could not possibly take credit for it. So you know that these are 300 very humble men. It's divine perfection and salvation and judgment and victory. And they carried the three symbols of divine protection. Jars, torches, and shofars. The jars were smashed. That represented the judgment of the wicked. The torches lit the way, representing the testimony of Yeshua, our salvation, and the light of the Torah. And the sound of the shofar signified the resurrection victory over the principalities and powers of darkness. So what is a true warrior? Do you want to be a warrior? Do you want to be one of 300? Do you want to be one of less than 1%? that show up prepared? What is a warrior? Number one, he's a volunteer. It said that Gideon sounded the shofar to call him in. Not everybody came. Some people hear the shofar and it means nothing to them. It's just a fox horn. <laughs> Easy. A true warrior is a volunteer. If I've got to fight somebody, I would rather have a volunteer by my side than someone that was forced to be there. Yeah. It said twice that they rose early. A true warrior rises early. If you rise early to keep your prayer habit, then blessings upon you, you mighty man of valor. I'm not a morning person. <laughs> a warrior continues to fight when he's tired, when he's hungry, when he's thirsty. A warrior follows orders, both the orders of the Lord of hosts and his human commander. What did they say? For the Lord and for Gideon. A warrior will even drink his water in a position of defensiveness. The test was if you just run down to the water, kneel and stick your head in, <laughs> you're not real concerned about the enemy. You don't ever do that if there's an enemy around. Work in a prison a day. You don't ever do that. You always put yourself in a position where you can see your surroundings. The men who would bring the water up to their mouths can see everything. They're alert. They know it's a battle. They know it's not a game. And they don't leave themselves open to the enemy. If you want to be a warrior, you need to be alert all the time. Even drinking a glass of water. Be careful because someone is always watching. Even their posture suggested they were ready to fight. 
That's what I like to do sometimes when I teach. I look at your posture, how you're sitting, what you're doing with your body. Sometimes that tells me whether you're ready to fight or whether you need to go back home and get a good night's rest. <laughs> a warrior is always ready. He's alert. He's on time. A warrior can hear and understand the battle plan. Now remember, 300 men had to do one thing at one time. What if some of them heard one thing and some of them heard another thing and some of them didn't have their watch set right? It would have been chaos. But they were in complete unity. A warrior has to be in unity with those he fights with. Yes. Or something's going to be off. They have to understand the plan and then follow it to the exact second. That's why they say synchronize watches. Because if my watch is two minutes fast, because I want to go home two minutes early, <laughs> then I'm not on the same page as you are. The sword of a warrior is a barley loaf. It's his devotion, it's his commitment to keep, guard, protect, work diligently for the sake of the covenant. Are we warriors of the covenant? Are we part of that less than 1% that's fit to fight for the sake of God's word, for the sake of his people? They found themselves in that condition because they had slipped. They had failed to be diligent in their covenant. And we have to be careful too not to slip, not to let it ease up on us. See, it said it took seven years. As the years pass, are we less diligent? Has the fire of our passion cooled? Have we lost our first love? Are we doing the work that we did at the beginning. If we slip, we are going to find that we are increasingly becoming entangled in the ways of the world. And it will begin to squeeze our freedom to walk in the covenant. There's nothing we want more than to walk in that covenant, to walk in His ways because we love Him. But when we feel ourselves restrained to walk as we think we should and need to do, it's because Israel has fallen into disobedience. And now we are paying the price of that. We are being oppressed. We should have a volunteer army of more than 1% because we have some advantages they didn't have. We've got Scripture at our fingertips. We don't have to wait till an annual festival to hear the priests come and read the entire Torah in one day. Can you imagine? We have a hard time sitting still for three hours. Can you imagine standing all day with a bunch of kids to hear the whole Torah read? They were tough. <laughs> You're a warrior if you can stand up all day to hear the entire Torah. But they were. They were tough. Those 300. Are we that tough? We've got the scripture at our fingertips. We've got every version you can imagine. We can even read it in Hebrew if we want to. We should have a much bigger volunteer army. You know what? This shofar will only go so far, but we have telephones, which are not to be brought in here, by the way. <laughs> if God wants to call you, He probably won't use a cell phone. We can do what we need to do to prepare ourselves to become warriors for the covenant because we have everything from Genesis to Revelation they fought without seeing the Messiah they fought out of faith that the Messiah would one day come and it was their responsibility to preserve the people in the covenant until he came we don't want to be a people who are not willing to take that responsibility to fight for this covenant for the next generation until Messiah returns for us Think of your children. If not for yourself, if you're too lazy to keep the covenant for yourself, then think of your children and your grandchildren. Because what you do, they do. Everything you do teaches them something. Whether you're a worker, whether you're a fighter, whether you're a complainer, whether you're a kneeler, at the water side, they observe these things. We have to prepare ourselves mentally, physically, emotionally to fight these principalities and powers that attack our covenant commitment. That's what Satan wants. Yes. He wants to steal your obedience. Yes. The more disobedient Israel was, the greater the enemy became. 
The same applies to us. There was no shortage of men capable of fighting. There was a shortage of men who were willing to fight back. Apathy is the greatest enemy of covenant life. Does it sometimes seem to you as though there's 135,000 Midianite warriors camped around your house and their camels are eating your lawn? Because you're not free to keep the covenant the way that you want to keep it, the way that is important to you. Are you tired of schools scheduling their activities on the Shabbat? I'm tired of it because what these kids do on Shabbat is life. It's their future. As they encamp on Shabbat, so shall their journey be. We may not always be here to guide them and help them. I'm concerned about that. What can I do? How can I fight back? Maybe I can write a letter to the superintendent and the school board and say, look, I love the children in our congregation. And it is part of their lives to enjoy a Sabbath rest. It is part of their lives to read the scriptures and to pray and to be united in faith and to learn about the things of God. It's important to me that they receive that blessing of obedience. And I humbly beg you to consider that when you schedule all these things on the Sabbath. See, if we're arrogant and we're proud, we'll meet resistance. But remember, Gideon used a soft answer to turn away wrath. Have we ever spoken to a Midianite and said, this is not okay with me? That you're trying to steal my covenant? Because if we speak up, let's remember something about Midian. Midian was salvation to Moses for 40 years. Moses married a Midianite. It was a Midianite woman who helped the armies of Israel defeat the Canaanite army. You might have some friends among the Midianites. And if you will speak up and ask for help, there's no telling what you might receive. You might find some friends out there. Let's not say because they are so many and we are so few that it's not worth a fight. We can speak up. We can do it humbly. We can do it kindly, but we can do it firmly. We might be less than 1% of the population of London, Kentucky, but if we were only two or three, it would be enough. So who and what are our enemies? What are the enemies of Israel? Obviously the Midianites and their camels who were chewing up the lawn. It says they ate every living thing. They just consumed it. Does anybody know what camel is in Hebrew? Gimel? Gamal? What number is that? Three. Three. Camel represents the number three. So there again in the story, we see a challenge. Only this time, it's not divine perfection. It's that challenge to divine perfection. Remember three times Yeshua had to say, it is written, it is written, it is written. When things come into your life, and they are challenges to your covenant and your obedience, you might have to say three times, it is written, it is written, it is written. Get rid of that camel, camel, camel. Get him out of my face. I will be obedient because it is written. And it says these particular camels wore crescent ornaments around their necks. They're still there. Their tactics were to overrun the land to destroy every living thing, to spread fear, to possess Israel and prevent them from moving about in freedom. But there was another enemy. And this is the surprise enemy because it's within Israel. It's within the camp of faith. There were some wicked elders at Sukkot. And that's why I say this, we just passed Shavuot. We're headed towards Sukkot, and we don't know what we will find there. Will there be faith at Sukkot? Or will there be wicked people? And the most wicked person is one who is apathetic, who will not help, who will not participate, who doesn't care. Not only would the, 
elders of Sukkot and the men of Penuel, they wouldn't fight the enemy. They wouldn't even support those who were willing to do it. Talk about posture. <laughs> That's the ultimate expression of selfishness and unkindness. You know, Sukkot, it, it denotes to us like that hovering presence of Adonai, like that tabernacle over us of protection, the chuppah, the marriage chuppah. We bless the children under the talit, under that covering. That's what Sukkot means to us, is that protection, that presence of God in our lives. And Penuel means facing God. You know what your enemy might think? They live in the presence of God and think that they talk to God every day face to face. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. But you can tell a lot by whether they're willing to pitch in and help when the battle is fought. They're kind of stingy people. And they kind of believe that they can just sit up there in their ivory tower and observe things while others expend their sweat, their blood, and their tears for the sake of the covenant. Gideon's response to the wicked men was not to ignore them. He just waited until the time was right. He had a job to do, but he returned to Sukkot to discipline that enemy. And it said in the translation that was read, it was entering, it says that he taught the men of Sukkot. Other translations say he thrashed them. It's because they're not sure how to translate that Hebrew word. It means to know. Da'at. He must have just flailed the daylights out of them with briars and thorns. What do the briars and thorns represent to the covenant? He said, this is the curse if you don't keep it. It's going to be briars and thorns for disobedience. So just not doing anything can be disobedience. And you will reap the briars and the thorns instead of the barley and the wheat. Apathy, insubordination, stinginess, those are worst enemies. That great wine press of God's wrath and revelation is going to be tread at Sukkot. And while the set apart witnesses who have consecrated themselves at Passover to the Lamb, they're going to be resting in that journey to a millennial Sukkot in Messiah Yeshua, since the wicked are disciplined with thorns, with briars, and the destruction of everything they place their trust in misplaced their trust in. Folks, time is short. Just between you and me, time is short. We hear that in the messages that are brought forth. The words that are brought forth say, prepare now, because if you wait, it might be too late. I don't know when too late is, but even if every one of us died of old age before Messiah returned, the time is still too short for us. We are not redeeming our time. We're not doing our best. We are not being diligent. We are going to have to work at restoring this covenant in our generation. Remember, Yeshua healed a man on the Sabbath. That is the work of the Sabbath, healing, restoration. And the hypocrites criticized him. And what did he say in John 5, 17? He said, My Father is working until now, and I myself am working. You need to work on the Sabbath. When's the last time you heard that? <laughs> <laughs> you need to work on the Sabbath. You need to heal people. You need to hear the Scripture. You need to discuss the Scripture. You need to share a common meal with the saints. Because... If we allow Yeshua to define Sabbath observance, that about sums it up. There's not much more than that. He said in John 9, 4 through 5, We must work the works of Him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no man can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. While we are in the world and Yeshua is in us, then we are the light of the world. But he clearly said a day is coming when we can't work. It'll be done. It'll be over. It's finished. The jug is broken. The shofar sounds. And there's no more time. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to motivate you and encourage you to redeem the time that we have. The day is coming when there's no work for us. If we've worked in the light, then we rest in those deeds. That's what follows after us. 
But if we did not work, it's just too late to start. You ever get onto your child for not doing something that you told them to do? And you finally just snapped and said, all right, that's it, you're grounded. And they ran over there and started trying to do it. But it was too late. It's just too late. Time's up. Timer went off. Every day that we are apathetic about our covenant, we are getting closer to a time when we might suffer the briars and the thorns of discipline and teaching in the covenant. Because it says he taught them that covenant with briars and thorns. I don't want to learn our covenant that way. I want to learn it at Yeshua's feet. Every day we are silent in respect to our covenant. Our children learn our silence a little bit better. Every day we fail to work hard for our Sabbaths and our festival seasons. We fail to work a little bit better than the time before. Remember, it's a rehearsal. We're supposed to get better. But if we're increasingly failing, what we are learning is failure. We need to turn that around. Let's work now to establish a great cloud of witnesses. I think there's a cloud in here. There's a shining cloud of witnesses who can testify to the covenant. We walk in it. We observe it. We're diligent. We plan. We work smart. We don't complain. And that's what Yeshua was seated on. A great cloud of witnesses who testify to the beauty and the light of His covenant. Let's fight right now to regain the land that the enemy has taken from us in our covenant. Yeah, there might be more Sabbath breakers in this world than there is sand on the seashore. Is that too much for us? Wherever two or three are gathered. That's all we need if Adonai is on our side. It doesn't matter how many people want to infringe upon us and how we keep the appointed times and the seasons. If we will work, if we will fight, then He who is in us is greater than anything else in the world. It's greater than a million camels. It's greater than a million Midianites. Because He gives us the strength. He gives us the lightning. He gives us the thunder. He gives us His Word. And it doesn't matter if we are the smallest congregation in London, Kentucky, and I am the least person in this congregation. It does not matter who you are. You are a mighty man of valor. According to the word, if you are willing to step up and do what Gideon did to fight for that covenant, yes, we are overrun, but it's not too late. It's not too late for us. We have been put in this generation for a purpose. You're not here by accident, and you didn't even choose this congregation by accident. That's right. He chose you. He puts you here. So what can we do? What's the first thing Israel did? Once they realized we're undone, we're overrun, and we've lost it. The first thing it says they did is they cried out to the Lord. That's where it starts. That's the first thing we have to do is to cry out to the Lord. We're going to have to start praying. And that's why Beginning next week, I guess. At 11 o'clock, this shofar is going to blow. If you are a warrior, if you are willing to fight, if you are willing to come in here and pray and see the Spirit move the way that it did this morning, because you are willing to be a mighty man of valor and fight for the covenant, you come in here when you hear that shofar. If you're not ready, if you need to fellowship, if you need to drink coffee, if you need to have breakfast, if you just need to talk to someone, and I'm not saying those are bad things. It didn't, just because there were only 300 warriors in Israel didn't mean that the rest of Israel was hopelessly lost. That's not what it meant at all. It just meant that they weren't ready at that time. If you're not ready at 11 o'clock, please stay in the fellowship hall and keep the noise down and drink your coffee or eat your breakfast or visit or whatever you need to do. 
But if you're willing to fight, if you're willing to pray with us and to cry out to God for one another, you can't do this alone. Gideon didn't try to do this alone. He called a congregation. He called a clan. He called a tribe. And then he called the rest of the tribes. You can't fight your battles alone. You're arrogant if you think you can. Don't keep it to yourself. Come in here if you need prayer. If someone is infringing upon your territory and ask for help. Yes. Let Jimmy anoint you with the oil early. Don't wait till somebody drags you up here. Seek help. Rise early and pray with us. Another shofar will sound later, around 11.15. Depends on what the Spirit's doing in here. And at that time, we ask that the general congregation come on in. But if you're going to be a distraction or have another agenda for that first 15 minutes of prayer, take care of it back there. Nothing wrong with being back there. You might see me back there some days. But I'm asking for warriors to show up at 11 o'clock. Fighters. What do they call it? Um, maneuvers. Maneuvers. Anybody ever been on maneuvers? Is it a real fight? Or is it a practice? Just practicing. Nobody's supposed to get hurt on maneuvers. The festivals are rehearsals. They're maneuvers. Nobody's supposed to get hurt now. But we don't want to enter into that final time where people do get hurt at the festivals. Where some people are separated unto holiness, resting in their deeds, but others are being reaped and they're being trodden under in wrath. So let's look back. We've had Passover this year. We just passed up Shavuot and now we're headed towards Sukkot. If these were maneuvers, if these were rehearsals, how do we grade ourselves? Give yourself a report card, not out loud. <laughs> but mentally, spiritually, give yourself a report card. How did you do on the practice run? I didn't like my report card because I heard myself say more than once, I don't care. That's wickedness. I don't care. I do care. I might mean something else entirely, but to say I don't care is to be the equivalent of an evil Sukkot. Not to plan, not to participate, not to join in, not to help those who are willing to fight. That's an enemy within. And those are the areas we're going to have to shape up before the next rehearsal, before the next maneuvers. Because remember, we don't want anybody hurt on maneuvers. But we do want to prepare ourselves and take it in all seriousness. If everybody just clowns around on maneuvers, what are they going to do in the real battle? Clown around. So we don't want to clown around with our festivals. We want to practice as though it's the real thing. It's going to be some blood, sweat, and tears, I guarantee you, because it's time we started crying out for one another. Yes. We kind of know what's going on in each other's lives, but not really. Until we start praying for those things in our lives, I don't think we can expect Midian just to pack up their camel and go home. We are going to have to cry out to get Adonai's ear. And if we will do that, He will help us. He will raise us up. As we encamp, so shall our journey be. Who wants to be a warrior on that journey? I do. I don't want to be someone that just didn't answer the shofar. I don't want to be someone that's not always alert to the devices of the enemy. I want to be one of those that can carry a shofar, a pitcher, and a torch, 
And when it's time, you don't do anything rash. Don't, don't take my words to say, well, go out and do this or do that. Remember, when we read it, it said Gideon was clothed with the Spirit. If you go out and you do something rash and you are not clothed in the Spirit when you do it, you will be defeated. So don't do anything brash, rash, impulsive, foolish. You wait. You hear from the Spirit. And when you know that you are clothed in the Spirit and you know that that Spirit is telling you to fight a battle, then you fight that battle. That's important. I mean, don't come back next week and say, I quit my job. <laughs> I need some groceries. You consider the right time and the right thing, and that spirit will tell you the right time. In the meantime, it's my job and it's your job for us to pray for one another so that we will, instead of finding our freedom more constricted, that we will find that we're pushing the enemy back and we're more free. Does that sound like a plan? Yes. Can we fight that way? Yes. Nobody gets hurt <laughs> except the enemy.